Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Manufactured in upstate New York, an employee-owned company, Golden makes the best acrylics, oil paints, and watercolors that you can buy. You can find them in your local art store, or you can find them online at goldenpaints.com. Sound and Vision is supported by the New York Studio School, where drawing, painting, and sculpture are studied in-depth, debated energetically, and created with passion. The school's full-time programs, a two-year MFA, and a three-year certificate prioritize experimental learning and perception. Beginning in fall 2021, the Studio School welcomes artists from around the world to join its inaugural virtual certificate program. Combining the studio-centric emphasis of the school's teaching methods with an individual real-time approach to online learning, this full-time program is designed for serious artists and dedicated aspiring artists who seek to cultivate the studio skills and methods that will prepare them for a lifetime of art making. The priority application deadline is April 30th, 2021. Apply online today at nyss.org. Bo Bartlett is a painter based out of Columbus, Georgia. He studied with Ben Long in Florence and received his degree in fine art from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. He's had numerous solo exhibitions nationally and internationally. Recent solo exhibitions include Morris Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia, the University of Mississippi Museum in Oxford, Mississippi, Love and Other Sacraments at Dowling Walsh Gallery in Rockland, Maine, Paintings of Home, at Idols Gallery in Columbus State University, Columbus, Georgia, a survey of paintings, W.C. Bradley Company Museum in Columbus, Georgia, paintings of home at PPOW Gallery in New York, and Bo Bartlett at the Ogden Museum of Art in New Orleans. Recent group exhibitions includes Rockwell and Realism in an Abstract World at Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, Brine at Soma New Art Gallery in Cape May, New Jersey, The Things We Carry, Contemporary Art in the South at the Gibbs Museum of Art in Charleston, South Carolina, and American Masters Somerville Manning Gallery in Greenville, Delaware, to just name a few. His work can be found in the permanent collections of the Greenville County Museum of Art in Greenville, South Carolina, LaSalle University Museum of Art in Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, the Denver Art Museum in Denver, Colorado, and the Seattle Art Museum in Seattle, Washington, amongst many others. Bo is the recipient of the Pew Fellowship in the Arts, the Philadelphia Museum of Art Award, the Museum Merit Award at the Columbus Museum of Art in Georgia, the William Emlyn Cresson Traveling Scholarship at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, the Charles Toppin Prize at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, and many others. I caught up with Bo leading up to his solo show coming up at Miles McHenry Gallery for a talk about technique and skills, traveling the world to recalibrate, making films, and hanging out with Andrew Weiss, and much more. Here's our conversation. So, I mean, you have you have a radio show, you have film, you have painting. There's a lot going on. And then, I don't know if you feel this way, this, this whole Zoom, you know, doing all this stuff online. And does it feel like there's, like, more stuff to juggle, ironically? Like not going out as much or traveling as much maybe, but maybe it's just that everything is kind of like filtered through technology and through messages and all that. It just, it feels a little overwhelming at times, doesn't it? (laughs) It's well, for me, it's changed, uh, because I don't have the responsibilities outside of the studio. Yeah. So I have this, um, opening of time in the studio. So it frees me up to do more creative projects. Um, yeah. But I was doing the radio show before the pandemic, so it wasn't until um, the pandemic hit that, that I felt like that I could um, really have the time to uh, do a lot of these other things that right. I want to do. 
Yeah, I have a hard time saying no to things too, which is <laughs> oh really? Start, That's a problem. <laughs> start, <laughs> starting, to, yeah. I'm starting to feel you know at times like maybe I gotta start adding that to my vocabulary because uh, I'm just so excited about projects and you know when things yeah. come up I just I can't say no to it I feel like life's too short but then sometimes wow. I, I, you get that feeling of like you know juggling I, I say this and I bring this up to you because in, in looking at your you know your chronology and your you know the things that you've done I feel like you're probably in that boat even more so maybe so yeah I can't say no I, I mean I I my therapist, I had a great therapist in Pennsylvania. He was a Jungian analyst, and he, he um, was always saying, if the no is inhibited in you, then the yes is inhibited also, which was great advice. That is pretty yeah, on point. Yeah, it, it was really good, really helpful. And uh, so I would try to practice saying no, and I still can't do it. Yeah, it's hard. I say yes to everything. Yeah, it's hard. Very hard. Well, I, I, for me, it's not... Um burdensome in the in the responsibility of it it's i feel sort of endlessly grateful to even have opportunities you know Mm because you know i have had friends and known people who've always you know wanted to do things and maybe that hasn't come across their lap and it's hard to say no to that you know yeah and i think as a as a painter you learn early on you have to say yes to everything (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. If you want to survive. Yeah, for sure. You know, do you want to take this commission of my dog? Uh, yes. I can do that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's really true. Like, you don't, you, it's, you know, out of survival, too, you know. It's just, out of survival. Yeah. But I feel like, also, too, I'm unencumbered by a sense of, um, I've I've known people who are really good at this, and I'm not, if... Like, I, I don't have that pressure on myself to feel like I have to ace everything. Like, I'm okay with doing mm. a mediocre job in life. So, <laughs> I feel like I could add more to my plate and just maybe just saturate, <laughs> saturate yeah. instead of uh, high quality. No, I, I joke, but I mean, I do. Yeah. I never feel like, I don't know. I, I wonder how you feel about this. I never feel like in making work that it's like the masterpiece like trying to make the thing it's more of the overall i i have a sort of collective view of of maybe a a creative achievement or or trying to encapsulate something you're really lucky is it is that is that lucky because that's lucky yeah because i i think every time like i only have one painting left and this has to be the masterpiece and i've lived my whole life and this is it and every single time I, I like you gotta nail get myself one. all psyched out. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, and, you know, as it, as it gets further along and closer and closer to being done, it's like gets tighter and tighter because if it's not perfect, right, right, it's going to prove that I'm, you know, an imposter and that, it, that I'm a fake. And it's, it's just got to be like really great. And then it gets near the end. The last three days, I'm in total depression because I suck. <laughs> and why am I even alive? <laughs> like suicidal <laughs> and then I finally like just give it all up and give get it out of there and then great hope on the na- next blank canvas <laughs> <laughs> back at it again now do you feel like you have that within you because I mean let's be honest your work is is maybe closer in visual dialogue to art historical um sort of methods and ways of working that could be considered masterpieces. Do you know what I mean? Not that, yeah. you know, not that a Rothko isn't a masterpiece, but maybe visually people don't look at those paintings. They see it more as an experience in a sort of, you know, if you really buy into that as an art viewer in, into, you know, something outside representation and something into the phenomenology of, you know, your experience, you know, you see it as an experience. Whereas, you know, if you look at, you know, certain pieces in art history. Like if I look at uh, Déjeuner Soulaire, I mean, that's a masterpiece. And I think that's the context of history, it's the iconography, it's the way we think about certain, you know, art historical sort of movements and ways of working. And, and I would think that your work 
visually aligns more towards, say, the Manet than the Rothko, even though maybe conceptually you're more in the Rothko state of mind. I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that would be a hard choice to make for sure. Right. Um, no, I, yeah, I totally <clears throat> think that if I can make it look as close to what I think of as great art looks like, that then maybe it could fake some people off and it could be thought of as great art. <laughs> <laughs> but it is pretty great so I mean you're, you're doing a pretty good job of it <laughs> you know I, I spent a lot of time looking at all the great paintings you know I spent a lot of time in Europe and taking a lot of copious notes as a young student like what makes a painting great you know and it's like uh, you know just percentage of light and dark and you know, like you know where the color hits and what makes your eye go where and um, you know and then I just learned every trick that I thought all the the greats had practiced and, and try to do a version of it myself yeah i'm always um i'm always really interested in, in chops and in people who have like natural ability when it comes to i'm unencumbered by that as well so i just go with what i got right so <laughs> you know like i think of my like i play guitar my whole life i'm okay mm-hmm. like i can play guitar you know i'm not a savant you know i can't play django reinhardt but you know i can mm-hmm. play like some grant green you know what i mean so I can play, but I'm not by any means outstanding. But I think about people like, say, Django Reinhardt, who are just, I mean, that guy. And he had like, you know, he blew off a couple of his fingers and when he was a kid. And he played like that. And I, I, don't, I don't know how, that's the other side of like how you navigate making visual work with, if you have chops like that, to where you have like natural ability to just, it's a little more, um, of a flow to make things look the way you really want them to look. And then how do you navigate? Okay, well, now that I've got this in my repertoire, what do I do with it? You know what I mean? Almost like someone who has, who starts painting and they have a studio filled with every art supply you can imagine. (laughs) It's like, what do I do with all this? Whereas if you go in with like, you know, some fine charcoal and a big sheet of paper, it's like, have at it. You know, what am I going to do? I'm just going to use this, you know? (laughs) Uh, yeah, I, I think about that in relationship to the a lot of the students are graduating out of the ateliers and stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've they've got they've learned all these great skills, but they often don't have the part, the other part, you know, where it's like, where are you going to go? You know, like you learn to drive, now where are you going to go? And and I tell my students that you know, I don't think you learn to drive so you can just drive around the block and, right. and prove how well you can take a turn you know right like right wave to your mother on the front porch as you pass hi mom look how well i can drive <laughs> and she's like hi son you know and you like drive around again just to show her you know it's like no 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 you're like the point of learning to drive was to take a trip in the first place and it goes somewhere but you got to decide where you're going to go and right. what do you want to see and so that's uh, a really great a analogy bit like that Yeah, because when you're driving too, it's, you know, you're not obsessing about every piece of the car. Ideally, you learn how to drive so you can go out and see the landscape. And then you have a greater understanding with the world at large or your environment. That. And not just like be a mechanic and obsess over like your gaskets and, you know, your alternator or whatever. Yeah. And uh, you drive unconsciously. You know, you're you're not even thinking about what your foot's doing or what your hands are doing and, and... you know, you get into that state where you arrive and you're like, oh, you know, like, right. I don't even remember driving. Yeah. Uh, and that's sort of hopefully the way it is. You're in that zone, same, very similar zone where you're on automatic. Right. When you're working and you've have forgotten how you're doing it. Do you feel like you've got, you've gotten, you seem to have bo- the best of both worlds that you have an understanding of the car and then you're out in the landscape enjoying the view, you know? I, I, yeah, literally and figuratively, I try to get out more. Get out of the studio. <laughs> get out of the studio. Well, you've traveled a lot too, um, right? So you grew up in Georgia. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Grew up in Georgia. And then we back you, actually. How did we you live in my childhood, childhood home? Oh yeah. So, well, how did you, how did, um, Philly become, how did that get on your radar? Um, so I was in Georgia at 18 and had read My Name is Asher Lev. Did you ever read that? Haim Potok? No, I haven't. Uh, yeah, it's a great, it's a great book. Uh, it was sort of a high school book, but um, worth, worth a read. 
And it's, he talks about a young artist who's struggling with his Asher Lev. He's struggling with his um, religious upbringing. And it was like this Hasidic Jewish Brooklyn Has, you know, religious upbringing. And so he wanted to be an artist, but he wasn't allowed to make graven images. And so he um, broke away at some point and became an artist. And But he didn't abandon his upbringing completely. But he went to Florence. And so I read this in high school. I, I, was, I knew nothing about art or how to be an artist, but I read this book. I was like, oh, he went to Florence. Okay, I'll go to Florence. So, you know, I, I went to Florence after high school. And then while I was there, um, it turned out that my high school girlfriend was pregnant. And back then, there, we didn't have internet and you couldn't call. So she w- would write letters and she'd say, you know, like, like two or three months in, she'd write a letter and say, well, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I'll, I'll come back, <laughs> you know, we'll get married, I guess. Um, and so that was, uh, it took about six or nine months or something before me to, for me to, before I got back. But I, in the meanwhile, I had learned to draw. I studied with Ben Long, who was an American expatriate, who was a student of Anagoni, Pietro Anagoni, a great Italian fresco painter, sort of who has a lineage that goes back to Michelangelo and Leonardo. Um, so, you know, I got a really good, fast dose of how to draw. Uh, from these masters and then but while I was there I asked around and said uh, you know who could I study with in America and there was a short list there was about 10 people that were painting realistically at the time yeah. you know in all of America right, right. <laughs> in 1974 um, uh, Andrew Wyeth was on the list and um, uh, Nelson Shanks were on the list and, and since both of them were in Pennsylvania yeah, I, I thought well I'll go there and try to find one of them and study with one of them and um, so I, le- I went back got married left Georgia and moved to Pennsylvania enrolled in the uh, what was it's University of the Arts now but it was uh, it was the Philadelphia College of Art at the time yeah. transferred to PAFA Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and s- tried to study with uh, I tried to go out and find Andrew Wyeth but he wasn't taking students called him on the phone and Got his number from um, <clears throat> got his number from four one one. Just like said, do you have Andrew Wyeth's phone number? And they gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I called him, and he was very nice. But he said, no, I don't take students. And he invited me out, but it turned out where I, I didn't meet him at that point, and so he was off painting that day. And so I, I went and studied with Nelson Shanks, who was a, a you know a portrait painter. Yeah, uh, he painted uh, Lady Di and. Um, Margaret Thatcher and the Pope and Reagan and Clinton. You know, he was sort of the, the biggest portrait painter at the time. So he taught me how to paint, <clears throat> how to paint what I saw. So between that, having learned to draw in Florence and then learning to paint in Pennsylvania, and I, I went, I stayed at the Pennsylvania Academy, which was crucial, I think, because there it was a more diverse. I mean, I, even though I'd learned to paint privately in Nelson's studio it was like putting it all together for the competitions that they had at PAFA. Yeah. You know, they had a, like a Crescent traveling scholarship that would send you to Europe. And so you had to actually um, impress the, the faculty and it was a very diverse faculty. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was a good education because I had to bring something to it, you know. Did it come easy to you? I mean, would, you know, as far as just like, your draftsmanship and the understanding of the materials or was it you know was it a slog to kind of learn all that stuff it's like anything once you learn to do it yeah you know it's like learning to draw uh was i mean i did it in a few months i learned to draw in a few months learning to paint was harder because i had to shift from a more linear way of thinking to a more open way of thinking uh just in terms of the form you know more open form yeah uh, so, so it, it wasn't a closed thing. It was more open and atmospheric. So, but once I was able to get through that mindset, I, yeah, I, I sort of got a handle on painting. Most Nelson's students worked with him for two years, and he only had two at the time. He had one on either side of him, and he wouldn't talk. He would just paint. And so you just you learned. Just watch. Uh, it wasn't osmosis. You just learned experientially. Yeah. yeah. So it was extremely. Um, you learn like that and you don't forget it. You know, no one's telling you anything. Right. I so I learned, his model would be sitting there and we would see how he, you know, 
read the color and uh, he said he would say painting's easy you just put the right color in the right place (laughs) (laughs) right making music is easy too you just hit the push the string at the right place that yeah you've got gold and and what is it uh if it if it sounds good it is good is that right (laughs) exactly that duke Duke ellington yeah Yeah, yeah. and it's like that with painting if it looks good it is good. right yeah Easier said than done, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a very interesting teaching method, though, because I always feel like, um, you know, to watch people do what they do is is probably one of the best ways to to understand it. But I think these days, in our you know pluralistic ways of of making, that you could really make people make work that looks like yours in a way. You know what I mean? So it's hard. It's like right. You know, like if I showed people how I work, they would be making paintings that probably looked kind of like mine. You know what I mean? Right. Because it's so specific. Yep. So it's interesting, well, though. But uh, but demos work. You know, it's great. Like when I'm teaching, you know, I, I don't teach that much anymore. But when I teach beginning painting and I teach people how to mix, you know, oil and, and how to do it. Like when I show them on their palette what's going on and then you can see their palette and it's all mushed and like all the colors are mixing and it's graying out and stuff, you know, you show them things. It's just so much more effective. I mean, talk about the challenges of the Zoom environment, you know, as far as teaching is concerned. I mean, there's something to be said for just being there and sort of picking up the brush and showing someone something, you know? Yeah, I think it's it's really the ideal way to learn. But I think that... um, there's that there's a couple of things one is that you would want the students to come to you that basically wouldn't mind learning to paint the way you paint yeah i mean in an ideal world you know it's like there's plenty of different people out there that can teach you things so you would hope that if they came to you that you know that they're coming to you for that reason to, right. to learn what you do um and secondly i think a lot of times in these sort of university environments that um art school environment they are um encouraging a kind of de-skilling you know right that that is not necessarily what the person came there to to learn and then they get confused yeah and uh and they're not sure about their original uh inclination like was i wrong to want to learn to do that <laughs> you know like am i sh- shamed for wanting to uh you know learn to do that right and, and that's a very complex uh, thing for a young student. Definitely. Um, you know, when I was at PAFA, m- majority of the teachers were painting more abstract expressionistic. You know, that was just, you know, the thing. And uh, I had a, a lot of teachers telling me, you know, you can't do that now. Like, what are you trying to right. do, you know? And I was like, I'm just doing what I want to do. Um, makes you stronger the way, I, though, right? I mean, you It know. makes you stronger. You really have to stand up for yourself. Right. Yeah. And, and regardless of what it is you want to make and you know obviously it's it's all good so whatever your temperament is and whatever your inclinations are you have to trust that and go with that and it's going to be different for everybody depending on what their dna is and what their experiences are totally what what they've come in contact with yeah i think that th- this idea though that's you know been withstanding for a while of like you know if you have the challenging time in school like if you succumb to it then you might not be strong enough to actually have the conviction to do what you really want to do. So those Mm -hmm. who, you know, face the adversity of having to challenge their, their own ideas and their own methods with faculty and with their peers, you know, if you can stand up to that, then you can pretty much, you know, weather the storm, so to speak. Yeah. And you have to find the middle way where you, you're not going loggerheads with them, but you're, you're giving in enough to them so that you'll win the awards at the end of the year. (laughs) Yeah. And and incorporating enough of their ideas into what you're doing so that it actually um, serves everybody. (laughs) Yeah, that's the art of negotiation as an artist. Yeah, and you you learn by negotiating. You learn by uh, giving in just enough to to win. Right. (laughs) Yeah, and not being a jerk. Like, that doesn't go far, you know. Yes, (laughs) Someone told Crucial. me that at one point in my career. Just don't be a, a you know an ass. Like be a nice yeah. person. People like to work with nice people. That is so true. I I I finally I, I was I had a hard time getting into a gallery for a lot of reasons. I mean the work I was doing. This is back in the eighties, and I finally got into PPOW. I think it was nineteen eighty eight or something. And I got out of art school in eighty one, and um, and I had had a conversation with Penny and Wendy. 
finally about it and, and they said, you know, we we took you on because you were nice. <laughs> <laughs> We, you know, we deal with enough jerks or people, people that are not nice, and you were just nice to work. You with. had to balance the roster. It wasn't about the the visuals. <laughs> exactly. It was like we just no. didn't want everyone to be a pain in our butt. <laughs> we need an affable person who would just come in, show some work, <laughs> not give yeah. us a hard time. Yeah, it's there's like, so much so much to be said for that. Yeah, I can open the door for for someone. Uh-huh. So your your Pennsylvania experience was a good one. Oh, it, yeah, it made me, I mean, in every way. Um, and all of the experiences that I had, whether that was at the Pennsylvania Academy or studying privately or, um, you know, the <clears throat> once I got out of school, I had a lot of success relatively early on. And I think it was just because the work sort of fit into that Philadelphia tradition yeah, relatively naturally. I mean, when I... I didn't know much when I got there, but you know, when I saw the work of Thomas Aikens, it was like, I was confused. I was like, that's like my work. Like that's the kind of paintings I want to make. Right, yeah. you know, like I was, I actually, I remember looking at the very first book. It was like, he had not, there weren't any books on him at that point. There was an old, uh, this was a university of the arts, which was Philadelphia college of art in 1975. I think there was a, a exhibition catalog from like the 1930s from Philadelphia museum of art. It was like little black and white photographs. And I honestly saw that and I was like, I thought it's like coming home. It's like I was seeing my own work, seeing the kind of work that I wanted to make when I got to be a, a real artist. And, and uh, it, you know that feeling when you yeah. find something that you didn't know existed and it's, it's, it strikes such a strong chord in you. Definitely. And so I wanted to just learn to, to paint like that. I did everything I could to try to learn to paint like that. So I'd studied anatomy and, you know, dissected and, um, you know, did everything I could to uh, absorb that. Right. Yeah, it seemed like a a really advantageous place for you to land. Because, you know, as as someone who grew up in Pittsburgh, I mean, that's where I'm from, you know, when I finally made it to Pennsylvania, or to uh, Philly, I was struck by, you know, the sort of history of it. It had a real kind of, you know, Liberty Bell feeling, you know, there was just a, yeah. an air of more historical. I mean, that stuff's in Pittsburgh too, but it didn't feel the same, you know. Mm-hmm. It felt a little right. more active. And, you know, I grew up um, sort of in the shadow of Warhol. You know, Warhol was right. always around in that imagery and that sensibility, I think, was within me from an early age. And I never questioned it really. It was just, it's Andy Warhol, you know, this is, it's something that I could relate to and that I, Completely. And I think it just became part of the fabric of like, you know, I grew up on Warner Brothers and Andy Warhol, you know, it's just, it, it informed me, but Philly seemed like such a more, um, historical town embedded in history. And, um, you know, that, that seems like it, it works with you in your work. <laughs> well, I always say all the great art comes out of Pennsylvania. No, well, you're right. That's a fact. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the art history books. <laughs> yeah, Pennsylvania's um, got a lot going for it, really. Oh man, it does. It's just it's, and it's very. I mean, well, Philly. I'm sure it's true in Pittsburgh too. But Philly is so real. You know, the people are so real, and they're there for the right reasons. You know. Yeah. Um, and sometimes they go off to New York, and sometimes they don't. But they're, uh, you know, and sometimes they do well, and sometimes. You know, they just sort of stay there, but people are doing work and real work and they're real people. And I just, I loved that and it just fit. It was, it fit for me. Yeah. I feel, um, and I'm, I guess I'm biased, but I feel like a lot of times when I meet people, you know, from Pennsylvania or, you know, Pittsburgh specifically, there's that blue collar kind of, they just seem kind of straightforward in a way Yeah, to a large, completely. Point. And I think that, um, which it's funny to think of Warhol because he has this persona of being like you know uh, hard to to get to know and but but the, like if you really get to know the story of Warhol, I mean he was mm-hmm. he was very much a true to himself like earnest mm-hmm. person, but there was this veneer of popular culture that he was trying to mirror. But um, yeah, yeah, I feel like that that resonates. How how long were you there, and then when did you move out of Philly? Um, I thought I thought I was there for the duration. I I 
got there in 75 and you know the bicentennial was happening and so there was a rebirth of philadelphia yeah. in a way uh, the pennsylvania academy had restored the old um um frank furness building so it was a you know brand new place to go to school um and i st- you know and i had my first show there uh, in 81 at, at locks gallery and you know had real success um made a living as a painter and raised three kids and you know lived outside of town in a you know three-story stone house and uh you know live in the live in the dream yeah sounds <laughs> nice yeah and then you know if it, you know showed in new york and uh i didn't really want to raise the kids in new york i just wanted them to have grass and so we had a big yard and they all went to public school out in the suburbs and it was you know it was I- idyllic yeah um you know diverse and rich and uh you know Hardworking, right. you know, blue collar, like you say, and so um, <clears throat> I uh, events unfolded, and in, in um, two thousand four, my marriage started to dissolve after thirty years. So um, it just, you know, the kids were getting older, and they were all sort of leaving the house and going off to college or wherever they were going. And uh, I had three sons, and I lost one. I lost the youngest one, Elliot. Uh, um, it was uh, a, a great place to live and a great place to be and to grow up as an artist. And but then when I left, I so I was there for thirty years, and then I moved. I, I moved to Seattle. Uh, I traveled around the world, uh, sort of in my in between. I don't know if that was a midlife crisis or not, but <laughs> I <laughs> two thousand four. I took a year and traveled around the world and um, sort of got my head adjusted. Like literally all over just, the world, like plane hopping. Yeah, I, I did. A, yeah, plane hopping from place to place, trying to just figure out what I was going to do next or what was going to happen next. And I, I was—I thought I was going to be a, a monk. I thought I was in. I thought a Buddhist monk would be a good option now. At that point, yeah, yeah. <laughs> simplify things so was, in the mind. Yeah, up in, I was up in the Himalayas, up in you know, Ting Tingboche and Pingboche, up and you know, studying with some Buddhist nuns, and um, and I was you know up in this monastery and you know, sequestered and cloistered and chanting and uh, meditating and doing these practices of you know giving and taking and then one day it just hit me I was like what are you doing <laughs> you know, you're you're like an American like what are you doing here <laughs> nothing triggered um, it it just it just came upon you it just hit me yeah, yeah it was just like divine intervention it's like boom yeah and I'm like what are you doing um I, I was. I think I was overcoming some uh, altitude sickness that I'd had because I, I climbed to this mountain peak that I got very sick for three days, and it was sort of at the end of that that yeah. um, where there wasn't a thought in my head, like everything was just gone. And what I think it, maybe I'd reached the mountaintop. I guess you know? I was going to say that must have been relaxing mentally, though. Like <laughs> re- that's a pretty heavy reset button. Well, I thought I was. You know, I thought I was going to die, and I didn't have anybody there to take care of me. So. Um, I was just alone in this. Honestly, it was like a cave. Yeah. Um, and I think it was after that, shortly after that, that I was like, "What are you doing?" So I and I thought, "Well, go back." And actually, you know, one of the first thoughts was go back to America, and then the second, one of the second thoughts was uh, make movies, like move to L.A., move to L.A. and make movies. Um, but I I went back and spent. I had culture shock when I got back to L.A., and I was just like. I can't stay here. This is too many, tra- too much traffic, too many people. I went up to Tassajara and tried to like calm down a little bit. And then I moved, went on up to Seattle and I met Betsy, my wife. And, um, and we had met as friends, uh, a year before, but, um, I went up and we connected and then the, the rest is history. We, we lived 10 years in Seattle and now we've moved back to Georgia in 2000. 12 or something yeah. or 14 so we've been here for a while um but back to back to my origin well how did you during that period of sort of i don't want to describe it falsely but like a sort of self-discovery or you know resetting recalibration uh were you drawing or were, were you thinking about art much or was it kind of in the back burner you're trying to empty things out completely um well i can't i I took a you know a journal. I always keep a journal, and I took a, a sketchbook with three colors. I took black, um, yellow ochre, and uh, white, mm-hmm. and I uh, just travel with those. And you, you can get quite a range out of those three yeah. colors, actually. 
Um, and so I painted little tonal gouaches, little gouaches as I traveled. Uh, and ideas came to me, so I, I did a, a series of paintings after that. I, when I finally did get back uh, on the horse in, uh, in Seattle, I did a, a show that was we showed at PPOW. And um, that was work, you know, it was a Buddhist monk and, you know, like uh, divorce paintings, people sort of being ripped apart on a stage, you yeah. know. Like, yeah. <laughs> Real life stuff. Yeah. 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 And I got, you know, and they were mostly grisaille kind of paintings and I got those out, out and done. And then I was able to move on to the next, next phase. Yeah. So, but you had been showing at PPLW before you took the leave, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I started in, uh, there. My first show was 88. Yeah. So that's a long and then, time. Then in, in 91, I had a bad review from Roberta Smith and, and I'd sort of thought about quitting painting because I was wanting to make some films anyway. I'd, I'd been to NYU, went to film school in 86. So I was starting thinking about making films at that point. And uh, so that's when I got connected with Andrew Wyeth finally. And I spent five years making Snow Hill, this film of uh, his life, a documentary of his life. Yeah. And that, that sort of sealed the deal for painting. I thought it was sealing the deal for, for filmmaking when I did it because uh, it was a, a good gig but by the time I was finished all I wanted to do was paint was it was it because um, the process was so different and collaborative and in a different time stretch and the whole bit I, no I loved filmmaking and I loved working with him but it was that I was so inspired by his by his art at that point yeah which which you know was he was one of the artists I knew as a kid I knew Norman Rockwell and you know Andrew Wyeth and maybe Salvador Dali and Picasso or something but you know it, did, it had to sort of be popular enough when I was a kid to for it to come into the house on a magazine cover or something yeah so when I finally got the time to spend with Wyeth at that point you know I was a mature artist and, and I was thinking he was sort of just like an old has-been country bumpkin guy <laughs> you know right <laughs> you know like yeah, he just you know paints barns and grass and stuff and like why would I like look up to that? But the the more time I spent with him, I realized, you know, I mean, he it, it is real soul work, and the the reason people so many people like it and connect with it is because there's something really mysterious that he's getting into that pain. Definitely, yeah. Um, that's magical, and that uh, it's hard to verbalize what that is. But it's, he's pouring his whole life into the paintings, and um, and they're very real and very true to his life and experience and so uh, I, I began to value that and then I just saw how he what he called illustrating his life I saw how he did that and then I thought well you know I can do my version of that now I've, I've learned so that was uh, from about 91 to 95 or something and then I, I did 94 I won a pew or 90, the end of 93 I won a pew grant and that grant allowed me to uh, just paint and not worry about making any money for a few years and so that's when I did most of my really large paintings, the war paintings, and uh, a lot of the paintings of the sort of uh, people um, hunting and homecoming queens and stuff. A lot of that, I was illustrating my life, all the stories from my life, I just went ahead and painted them all. So you had with, you had freedom with that? You felt like you could just go, you know, do your thing and not really worry about it. I think it's a really liberating thing, right? To not have to oh, worry, yeah. like, oh, is this the kind of work... You know what I mean? Where you just say, "Okay, yeah. I got carte blanche here for a couple of years." Completely, and it, you know, pe- people talk about grants and the importance of grants or residencies and stuff. But I mean, it, it was at a, it was at a turning point in my life where I, I was suddenly given that much space yeah. to be free, and and I took full advantage of it and just painted nonstop, painted everything I wanted to paint, and and they turned out, you know, people liked them and they were successful more or less, and. Um, and then the big ones that were just unsellable because they were too big have all wound up at the center, uh, the the art center yeah. here in Columbus, yeah. because they were too big to go anywhere else. It's amazing, you know, thinking of that story and um, the time. I mean, the times were a little different then than they are now. But this idea, I think that I, I would always have a hard time being a critic and being hypercritical because that that idea that you could have like a really bad review or not that yours was really bad, but I'm just saying, Oh, it was bad. 
No, An artist could have like, bad. you know, a bad review from someone who's thought of as having a really important voice. And then you could be like, all right, I'm hanging it up. That's that. That's a wrap for me. I mean, that's the a like to have the power of that voice to, to where if you don't think what that artist is doing, you could effectively almost like terminate them or cancel them in a way. And then, I mean, a testament to your resolve that you just kept going with it. But um, it's it seems like it, that would be difficult because to your point about Andrew Wythe, I mean, even if um, I've kind of learned this over the years, I think myself, because when I was a student in grad school, there was work I liked and people that I was like, yeah, I don't really like that stuff. You know, like I just cast mm-hmm. off. So, but you realize the more you talk to people, the more you get to know mm-hmm. artists that, you know, even if the work, if, if it doesn't resonate with you, most of these people who get to a certain level they're living, breathing, and, and working this stuff. It means everything to them. You know what I mean? Completely. It might not be in Completely. your wheelhouse, but to just be like, this is crap, or like, you know, this is not relevant. You know what I mean? You're casting off someone's entire creative life in a way, which is really difficult, you know? And I, I don't yeah. know if I could live with that kind of uh, input. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I brought it up to them. Uh, we were up in Maine a couple of summers ago, and Jerry and Roberta were there you know, at a, in a Rockport giving a talk yeah. and there were question and answers afterwards. And I, I raised my hand and said, you know, how does it feel? Like, what do you think about it? that? You can like basically ruin someone's <laughs> life, you know, and asking for, they a friend. waved it off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They both waved it off, you know, and were very quick to, Oh, we don't have that much power. And so, um, afterwards, Inca S and I and Steve Mumford and yeah. I were and Betsy were, um, in a little bar next door and, and I was telling him the story about why I asked the question and Inca said you know that was personal like you, you really should go back to her and, and like tell her that story and that it they do have that much power yeah. they really do affect people's lives and so I thought yeah you're right we'd, we'd been drinking a little bit at that point right, right. Listen <laughs> up a little. And so I went back over to the to the venue and at the opera house and, and they were still there uh, cleaning up and finishing up. And so I went over to Roberta and told her, I said, you know, like you gave me a review in 1991 where you said my paintings were idiotic. And, um, and she said, Ooh, that's a harsh thing to say. Right. That, you that know? thing where it's like, Oh, did I, did I do that? <laughs> yeah. Did I say that? Like, yeah. It had um, a big effect. And so, you know, like we had a little cathartic moment and, and we like had a little moment of, um, connection and healing and it was really beautiful and you know and I do love those guys I, yeah. I really love them both and um and then I was walking away and she she sort of like called out to me she said but there is a little truth in every review I write <laughs> and that was her last words to me it's <laughs> give me a little one on the way out the door yeah just a little twist as I was leaving it's like oh, okay so um yeah it was pretty funny well I think the moral no, of that they, they do the, they have great yeah the yeah. moral of that too is that you know, you can't put too much stock in what one person says. You know what I mean? If mm-hmm. if you hear mm-hmm. like 50 people saying the same thing about your work and criticizing a certain element, I think it, you have to listen to that. You know, you have to think, well, they might be on to something here. You know what I mean? But that's right. If you put too much like if you have one professor, if you're a student in school who just gives you the business and, you know, you can't hang it up based on that, you know. Well, yeah, but I mean, you believe what you read the New York Times. If there's any source that we, you know, believe is truth and all powerful and all knowing and omniscient because they filtered everything already, then it's the New York Times. Right. So you read it in the New York Times and you believe it. Even if it's your own review, you're like, oh, that's the worst review I've ever read and it's mine. So it's, it's pretty disheartening. Yeah. Um, but I, I honestly, I, Andrew Wyeth saved my life. If it hadn't been for Wyeth uh, to come in and, you know, and they actually called me out there because of the review. The, the timing was such that his wife had seen the review and knew of my work because I was had a little local renown around Philly. And she called me out. And so um, and she invited me and, and I went out and she was like telling me how much, you know, I brought a catalog or she she had a catalog at that point And she was looking through it and telling me how much she liked the work. and That's really um, nice. And then, well, yeah, and they bought work, and then they hired me to do this film. So I was there with them all day, every day for five years. And and then Andrew just we became best friends, and and he loved what I was doing. He said, "I love what you young people are doing." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, you're so fearless. You'll do anything. You know? <laughs> and um, and so 
Andrew Wyeth loving the work in the end was the thing that saved me because otherwise I, I mean, I, I trusted that he, you know, he's a hardworking artist and I trusted that opinion. Yeah. I think it's, um, maybe not spoken about too much, but I think artists, we do this thing where we will, um, it's almost like a safety blanket where we'll, maybe a lot of people will align their work with something that they feel like has been sort of thought of or revered as something important yeah. or worthwhile. And, you know, especially if your work isn't, let's say, you know, lockstep with what's in vogue at the moment, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To, um, yeah. to sort of feel like that, that safety of like, well, it, it can't be that bad because I'm trying to have the work resonate with this other thing that I know is sort of important and thought of as well. And I think that yeah. a lot of times gives the artist the wind and the sails to keep that boat afloat. You know? Yeah, for sure. I think that that's, uh, well, the way I've, the way I've always thought of it is like, if you see a niche, yeah. um, and that niche, if you could fill that niche, then go for it. Yeah. And try to fill it. And for so sure. as a young painter coming through in, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, I mean, I saw a niche for, you know, like, when Andrew Wyeth passed, like, is there going to be someone to fill that niche of, like, the American painter, you know? Like, and, yeah. and that's in the traditional sense of, like, Winslow Homer and Hopper and Wyeth. And, you know, it's like, I'll aspire to that. I mean, I, you know, like, somebody's going to have to do it. And so I'll, like, see if maybe I can give it a shot, you know? So... Yeah, I mean, I think in that regard, I mean, I don't have an agenda or I don't have like a program or some like a strategy, but, um, you know, I think it's like a goal. I think we have to have short-term goals and long-term goals. And, um, you know, like having a goal of, um, you know, trying to bring everything you've ever learned together and put it together into the work and drive all the horses at once and make the very best work <clears throat> that your experiences and knowledge can can create and um it's a worthy goal whether you achieve it or not uh, yeah you know like just put your whole life into the work and you'll either fill that niche or you want but uh, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with aspiration i don't think it's you know it's sort of different than ambition i think ambition is sort of more like career stuff right. but it's like it, for your own peace of mind in your own heart like why are you doing the work? And there is that distinction. Like I, I've never really thought about career. Um, I mean, subconsciously on some level, I must it must slip in and out. But and, and you want to be successful because who wants to be a failure? Right. But but um, yeah, you know, I just think about the work. I put put all my time and energy into the work, and then oh yeah, you got to have a show. You got to eat. Yeah, yeah. The whole you know? that, that that part. Well, do you think <laughs> the fact that you've managed to be able to show and to have a career a quote-unquote career you know you'd be able your work has been engaged in the public in you know places where a lot of people will go and interact with it but you've been able to sustain you know having yourself outside of you know a a a super high you know because philly is philly yeah it's a city but it's just like it's like pittsburgh in a way like you can be there and work and it's a little less uh, exhausting in the sense of like that mm-hmm. pressure and you know where some people need that to feel to make the work and to be driven you know not everyone does and a lot of people flourish outside of that but then it's it's sometimes it's more difficult to, to stay engaged or just to, to keep the career side of things moving but it seems like you were in a good place because you were able to keep that moving and you were able to also sort of step outside that and be you know, in a location and in a situation that worked for you and was a little less, you know, that rat race feel, right? Yeah, I think uh, Andrew Wyeth always said, he said, you have to be ingrown to be any good. Yeah. You have to be in, ingrown. And it's sort of like uh, not too focused on the outside. You have to really be f- charged and focused on the inside. D.H. Lawrence said, any fate that comes from the outside is a false fate. Um, so, I always have tried to keep myself out of the mainstream enough to uh, really keep focused on the work. Right. I don't know if that's a good strategy or a bad strategy. Uh, you know, in terms of career, it's probably not a smart strategy. I mean, being in New York, right in the center of things, would have been a better strategy. But uh, for myself and my soul and my who I am, it, I, it may. I don't know if it's fear of success or if it's just protecting. Uh, the work so that I'm not distracted by anything and I can just focus completely on the work and um, 
you know um yeah well i think everyone has to find what works best right yeah everyone does have to find what works best for them and i th- i th- uh you know now i feel like there's a, a it's a a time when people artists really can live anywhere and i think you know and that's an internet thing probably more than anything else because yeah. you can live anywhere and still share the work or you know show in new york and or wherever you can make your NFTs wherever you are. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It will. It's, you know, everything right now is a little fractured as far as, you know, location is concerned. You know, it's your IP address yeah. really, which is uh, yeah. doing a lot of the talking these days. But yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's different now, but when you were, you know, in like the early nineties, that's a different kind of, you know, metric of, of that stuff. Um, it, is, it, is film something that you're still engaged in and still wanting to do or? Oh yeah. We just, we just finished our first feature. I mean, it took 35 years to make, but we Whoa. just finished it. So it's, it's out on, yeah. Well, I, I don't quit things usually, uh, unless there's a real reason to quit them. Uh, so I went to film school in 86 to make the film that we just finished. Um, wow. things don't stay fixed. That's, that's a tenure. <laughs> Um, did, was that NYU? Yeah. Didn't you study? Perseverance is the key. Yeah, Tish. Yeah, yeah. it was the. Uh, it, it was intensive. It was uh, a summer, a two year program crammed into a summer. That's cool. I mean, uh, you must have learned a ton. It's such a great school. So, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I learned what it takes, and I started the process of of making the film right when I got out, and worked with a screenwriter, Sandra Deer, out of Georgia, and uh, she was at the Alliance Theater, and we wrote a screenplay, and we've written several screenplays since. But this is uh, Things Don't Stay Fixed was the first project. And so when we got down here to Georgia you know, a few years ago and the uh, uh, film had come to Georgia, it was the, you know, the single most f- films are made here more than anywhere else in the world now, more than California, New York yeah. or anywhere else. So um, we, uh, there was a Georgia Film uh, Academy uh, and they were giving interns to people to make films and giving money so you know we got a crew of 50 people uh, for next to nothing and uh, put together the film and self-funded it and but it's you know we were we made a decent film i like the film a lot actually uh it's it, after it changed and morphed a lot but uh to get distribution was the the miracle i'm not sure how that happened i think maybe covid helped because there weren't many films in the pipeline yeah, so they we didn't reach out to them. They they heard somewhere along the way that we had a finished film, and they they contacted us. So it was Indican Films and, and Lionsgate that reached out to us, and so we um, we have distribution. It's on all the platforms. So. That's great. Thirty five years in the making. Yeah. So what did that yeah. feel like when it when it left? You know what I mean? When it. <laughs> well, each step along the way, I, I was not sure. You know, you're never sure if it's ever going to happen, but you just say, "Well, I'm going to keep going." Yeah. No matter what. Um, right up till the very, very end. I was about to break it all back down. I had it on my computer and uh, we'd f- had a finished edit, which we'd done in Atlanta with a editor from New York, Matt Garner, who works with um, Scorsese. And I had it and I was like, no one's ever gonna see this now. You know, like, <laughs> and I was like, I think I'll just break it all back down and make it like an art film, you know, like just make it a completely abstract thing. And cause it was, you know, it's, a, it's an accessible film. Um, I was about to do that when they called and said that they wanted to distribute it. And I was like, okay, good. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, those kind of things are good, right? Because like, if you don't have that show deadline or something, you potentially some people, the way they work, it could just rework something forever, you know, forever. Which is, I can. guess it's not necessarily a bad thing, but if you do, you can almost like never move from something. You're just moving in something, you know what I mean? Which is, yeah. You know, if if you look at Picasso, I think he did a lot of that, where he kind of moved through things with a work, but he made mm-hmm. multiples mm-hmm. of that, like Las Minas or something. You know, like he right. he was in there for a while, but he was making different works and he would stop. He knew when to say, "Okay, next, I'll work on this," and you know, fragmented it in a really interesting way to where you could see the process, which was nice. Whereas if you're constantly work, reworking something in your own studio, people normally aren't seeing it, so it's basically it's kind of nice to be able to witness that, um, that, that working through ideas, even if it's the same thing, you know, the, the problem is once you finish something, uh, 
um, it says a lot about you. So it, oh, if you it? never finish Shoot. anything, <laughs> if you never finish anything, then you always have potential, right? Uh, so you, it could always be great if you'd only finished uh, it. See, that's, so. that's, that's wise. I haven't gone there, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good way to think about it. You live long enough. And so um, with the film, yeah, I had to let go of all of my dreams of it every step of the way. So every, it was f- amazing in my mind. I'd owned it for all those years. And it was one of the reasons Betsy, my wife, encouraged me to finally make it. She said, you got to get this out. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, she'd hear me talk, you know, speak lines from it like things don't stay fixed you got to keep coming back to them or, or whatever the line is you know and i and she'd hear me say these things and as if they were a reality she said nobody knows this stuff but you Bo. like this is not a funny joke because it's only you like, you got to get it out so she was very encouraging and that you need somebody to encourage you to do this stuff so finally we got it done and uh, but i had to let yeah. go of every every scene which had lived in my mind a certain way with actors you know with like with like Jeff Bridges or something, you know, I had to let these scenes go right. with the actors that we had and with the technology we had. And I had to make that adjustment and the adjustment to reality is hard to make. Yeah. You know, it's like the, the difference between the idea and the creation is, is where the shadow lies, you know, Definitely. It's like that space in there. And so, yeah, well, um, so that was a, a fun process. Yeah, I can, a fun process. I can imagine. I mean, it's the, literally letting it go. The blessing of the curse of that is, you know, it's like I feel like the opposite end of the spectrum. I can never spend too, too long on something. And I, I just mm-hmm. I work through ideas quickly. Like I have a, a need to not spend too, too long on one thing. I don't mm-hmm. I, I don't know why, but I just can't, you know, set myself up for something that I'm just going to I, I kind of mo- I have to move through stuff. You know, yeah, I understand. I mean, when I was younger, I had so much energy and angst and everything. It was like you know, I'd just get something down and get it to the certain point. And you know, and Vince Desiderio and I, we had studios next to each other in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia when we got out of the academy, and we would just like go through ideas as fast as we could and and uh, we'd get it to a certain point. And the joke was, you know, you get the idea. Right. You know? It's like <laughs> yeah. no need to finish it because you've expressed the idea. Um, but when I was spending a lot of time with Wyeth, you know, Wyeth would say, push it as far as you can because you, you'll, you'll fail, you know, you'll, you'll kill it, but yeah. you'll learn that edge. You'll learn that point where it suddenly it breaks through into the next thing, you know, beyond that. Right. And so he, he, he taught me that and I often just kill them and they don't break through the next thing. But when it does, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. You know, it's like, I didn't even know that was. I, you look at you know, I can't believe I had anything to do with that. Like that just happened, you know, but it happened because you sh- kept showing up, kept showing up and then it broke through. But you know, more often you're just beating a dead horse. But right. Yeah. There, there are times and it's those times that you're thankful for. Definitely. Um, um but I, 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 I love the, also love the economy of means. I love when someone just can get something and it's just there with the least amount of effort. I mean, that's, you know, there, there's a, a a book, and it's a, a really archaic book, and it's uh, The Mind of the Maker by Dorothy L. Sayers. Do you know that book? I don't. Yeah, You're giving me a, good suggestions uh, today. This is a fascinating book. Um, it's about how we think of creativity and creatives, and it, a lot about writing, but, you know, you can make the jump pretty easily into painting. Yeah. But she talks about a, a kind of trilogy, a, a trinity of, like, idea, energy, and power idea energy and power where um it's sort of like a father son holy ghost yeah. kind of thing where um those things have to all be in balance so but the idea has to be in balance with the amount of energy you put into it for the power to be like a um equilateral triangle which has the most stability to be the strongest yeah yeah to be balanced so if the idea is something quick and notational you know you want to have the hand and the completion that's quick and notational uh, for it to be in balance and so the, the slightest little cartoon can be as strong a work of art as you know the most grandiose you know thing if if it's in balance yeah. um, and, I, and I find that fascinating you know I think like a Keith Haring is, is in perfect balance with itself yeah and that's why it has the the power and the strength that it has you know but <clears throat> you know Guernica Guernica does too and, right you know uh Las Meninas, and all you know the, the the great great all the great work, regardless of what level it is. Um, yeah, I thought is of uh, that, has that balance. I thought of Ellsworth Kelly when you mentioned that. 
maybe mm-hmm. not just because mm-hmm. the triangle, but there a lot of that work is is very minimal to you know. But then the shape of the canvas with that color and then the minimal it's just a yeah. really great balance of intent mm-hmm. idea and formal energy or something you know that yeah it's a, it's an interesting dynamic you know the dynamics of a piece in that balance between the intent the way it's um, pulled off and what's you know the ingredients how that works together that's right and i think it does all come back to original intent uh, there's a great essay by Ken Wilber about what and where is art. And it was actually an essay that was used in a Andrew Wyeth catalog, a Greenville, South Carolina catalog. But Ken Wilber talks about that. He talks about art lies in the original intent. And that's where, you know, you can't fake it. You know, it, it's it's revealed in the hand. You're going to see it when you actually look at the real piece. Not, not online, but in person. Um, and it's... It, 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 great art will take your breath away you know it will it'll um yeah. wake you up and and that's what it can do and that's where you can't deny it you look close at a work and you'll you'll see it in the hand like why are they doing it you know are they trying to impress their mother right. <laughs> <laughs> or are they trying to connect to the gods right exactly <laughs> yeah and i like that idea that that sort of balance it doesn't matter necessarily what the aesthetic Mm -hmm. is or what the ingredients are. That's why you can have a lead belly song that's amazing. And then Mm -hmm. you can have an Ornette Coleman, you know, track Mm -hmm. that's, you know, you've got eight people playing in unison and it's, you know, super out and that works, you know what I mean? And then there's a guy with an acoustic and that works too. Completely. And, and I think one of the great things about music and the way we think about music is all of those forms are accepted. You know, in the old days, they'd go into the music store and you'd have, you know, rock and then you'd have country yep. and then you'd have jazz or, or blues or whatever, R&B. But, you know, they're all accepted in their different genres. And art, you know, we, we tend to, you know, the latest thing in the moment is like the only thing that matters. Yeah, right. you know? <laughs> and everything else is like, oh, that's you know, passe, it's like gone. Right. It's not important anymore. But whereas, you know, it'd be nice if we could get back in a footing where all these things can coexist with on sort of, I mean, some are, I don't want, it's not a hierarchy, but, you know, some are higher art than others, but but it can all exist and have value. Uh, in a, and, and, you know, and, and in some ways you know, in our postmodern world, we do, post-postmodern world, we do sort of have that, but not really. It's always just like, what's the latest thing? Yeah. And that's the most valued thing. Yeah, and people align with a certain, you know, whether it's a figuration or, you know, mm-hmm. middle abstraction or whatever it is. It's, I don't, I always have a hard time. Sometimes it happens with students where they're like, yeah, I just don't know how to talk or look at abstract work. Like, if you're an mm-hmm. artist, it, you, I don't understand that. Like, you know what I mean? You should be able no. to. That's, or, or someone who, that's a singer songwriter, is like, well, I just don't understand rap music. It's like, well, you, you may not like it, but how do you not understand it? Uh, you know what I mean? How do you not understand what what's the intent is there and what you know what it's saying and the the rhythm of it? You know, I just it, it seems like if you are making if you're creative and you're making work, then it's part of your responsibility to sort of understand and think about how this plays out in different ways other than the way you're interested in. You know what I mean? Completely. I mean, I think that it's important to have your interest in, in what you're interested in and, and to know what that is and how that, but you need to know how it sits in there in a relationship to everything else. Yeah. And, and the only way to know that is to know everything else. Right, you know? right. <laughs> and do the freaking homework. Yeah. and Or at least uh, be open. And, you know, be, like be I've, open to I've had teachers who... Looking and listening. Yeah, I've had teachers mm-hmm. who come into the studio who had an agenda. Like, you know, they're this person, they work this way. And they just don't want to see what you're doing. And as a as a teacher, I think that's so irresponsible to not, you know, to just align yourself with like, oh, this is the right way or this is the way I like making things. I don't even want to look at that sort of thing. You know what I mean? Right. And uh, right. I, I think, you know, it's just, it, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. You know? No, it's it's art. Yeah. It's, and it's all good. Right. I agree. <laughs> you know? I agree totally. And, and, and uh, it, tastes are great, you know, t- tastes are fickle and it's, uh, things that I hated when I was young, I'd love now and vice versa. And, um, you know, it, it, that you got to realize that tastes just sort of come and go like fashion, right. but you know, the stuff is the stuff and, and we, and, uh, what, what matters is, is for each person though, is to, to, to really come to terms with their own temperament and their own personality and, and trusting 
their own instincts and being bold enough to do it wholeheartedly and not with a kind of uh, embarrassment or shame, regardless of what it is that they're making. So, you know, getting to that point where you trust yourself yeah. is so crucial. Definitely. And that's where, uh, you know, knowing yourself, know thyself is, is really the most important commandment where you um, write and you know your dreams, you know the unconscious uh, motivations behind what you're doing and you, uh, and really, um, in the end, you're creating your own world and your own reality. And, and if, it, if it has a universal, universality to it, if it has a connection to the outside world, you go from the microcosm to the macrocosm, and, and people will get it. And if it doesn't, it will still strike some people as interesting. Yeah, or, definitely. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll find some connection to it. Some kid will see it and think they would you know, when they get older, they'll do their version of that. And, and, you know, we're all part, we're all just pissing in the ocean. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I, w- I want to say that it's a gift to have that, you know, to feel that way. But I do think it's kind of earned because I think as you get, as you age as someone who's creating it, you, you realize that or you, or you, we joke and say that's, it's almost like as you get older, it's like, I don't just give a shit anymore. It's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't really care. Like I'm into what I'm into. If you're not, Oh, well, but I do think there's something to be said with like, you know, you kind of earn a, uh, a, a sort of uh, comfort in what you're trying to express, irregardless of all the external voices or whatever. But I do think it's a gift when people have that chip early on, you know what I mean? And speaking of someone like Picasso, he must've had that chip early on to make the moves he did, mm-hmm with the gifts of his draftsmanship and like the way he worked and then to move through all that stuff. I mean, he had a gift of not caring and just being like, I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, Miles Davis was like that, you yeah. know, he, mm-hmm. he wasn't afraid to like do on the corner, you know, or like mi- take a move in a different direction that people would just be like, what the hell are you doing? You know what I mean? It's just like, this is what I'm into, you know, that, that courage is uh, a constant, um, desire to one desires that kind of courage and one uh wants to help move art forward uh on what in whatever way they can because art is this thing much bigger than us yeah um uh, and i think that we just have to know and trust that if we are doing the thing that we feel uh, like we're making the art we'd want to see in the world that hasn't existed before or revert our own version of something that has existed before that, that, that we're adding to the whole. And that's, um, that's playing our part, yeah. you know, but I think, We're, we're also from the outside feel um, like that we should evolve and grow uh, and be progressive I guess right. or, or um, you know move art forward and that's a, a constant um, it's not an inner urge that is an outward urge that we feel like to be worth our salt we need to try to help uh come up with new ideas and, and new things that haven't existed before. But I don't think that that's um, a bad influence. I think that it's a good influence. Um, but we have to, it has to be organic and it has to evolve naturally. And we can't force it because if you force it, um, it's different than um, than it actually happening yeah. in an organic way. Uh, I, I think, I think, and I'm not, you can tell I'm grappling with it because as an artist, I like the way I paint. I like what I do. I like the, the paintings I make. And, and I'm making the paintings that I'd like to see in the world that don't exist in the world. And that's my little job. But at the same time, um, I want to keep beginner's mind and I want to be able to keep feeling uh, like I don't know how to do something. That's why right. we do radio shows and make movies and do other things, right? We keep yeah, learning. Yeah. And keeping beginner's mind is crucial. So I'd rather, instead of necessarily changing my style of painting to, to for it to have a more, whatever, modern style or whatever that would be, I, I'd 
rather try something in a different medium. You know, I'd rather make a film, which gives me complete beginner's mind because the learning curve is so steep. Right. Um, and I'd rather try something in a different medium to, so that that's where I find that, that n- growth. Uh, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, I do animation and yeah. that's, that's film for me. Mm-hmm. And I don't really, right. I've taught myself what I do. And, you know, it, I have that sort of feeling of it's just a, a little more uncharted territory in a way. And then honestly, that, speaking yeah. to other artists, like, has been really wonderful for me, you know, to do, mm-hmm. have all these conversations with different people, I feel like, informs my life in a different way. It's almost like having kids to where you, you just see the world differently through other people. You know what I mean? And there's a real, Completely. it's a, it's a gift, you know, because before kids and before, you know, talking to other artists like I do now, I mean, it was just the me show, you know, it's just like whatever I'm just mm-hmm. in my own, it's like an, you know, an infinite loop of just like what's going on in my mind. And, you know, mm-hmm. getting yourself outside of that, I think is really useful. Um, it's absolutely mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think it's important for sure. Definitely necessary. Yeah. We, necessary. Because we <clears throat> required, <clears throat> Even though Andy said, you know, you have to be ingrown to be any good. The, the truth is, and anyone that is any good is making their own reality. They're creating this world. You know, it's not a siloed thing that's like just, but but they are, that's almost everything they care about. There's a famous story of Lloyd Goodrich showing up at Andrew, I mean, at uh, Thomas Aiken's house uh, in Philly when he was an older older guy. And Lloyd Goodrich was talking to him about all the current things that were going on in the world. And he said that, Aikens only cared about his own work. He only wanted to talk about his own work, you know? And it was like, I think that's what happens. We, you know, that's our whole life is going into the work. And so it is what we care about. Yeah. And, um, but in a, in a holistic way, we have to be conscious of everything. And in doing that, we lose the self um, as we realize that we're part of this larger whole and that our, you know, our contribution is just a teeny tiny little contribution, no matter um, what percentage of our life energy is going into making that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think the, it reminds me a little bit of the shift uh, of Susie Goblick's, um The Reenchantment of Art. Did you ever read that one? You're killing me because I'm I'm batting I'm it's over three on the book. I do read <laughs> s- s- <laughs> <laughs> no, occasionally. You could completely you could come right back at me. It would be easy. But um, <laughs> I Susie read, Goblet. I read Infinite Jest. That took me like years. So does that cover a little bit? <laughs> okay, Sorry. then you're Susie. plus one, plus plus one. Um, I, um, I I it changed my life. I was right, painting in Pennsylvania, working on these big giant you know historic history kind of paintings personal history paintings and um, read The Reenchantment of Art and uh, and it really changed because she's talking about it's sort of about social practice in a way but it was back in 1991 or something and it was about uh, what's her name Butterfly that uh, lived in the tree out in, uh, in the northwest so they wouldn't cut the trees down uh, the redwoods and st- things like that uh, so that it was about how can art really start to change the world and change the planet and what kind of art does that and there was one fellow that walked along the Rio Grande River and picked up trash you know that was his art form yeah. and and but I was like and I so I, I actually called Susie Goblick I got her information got her number from information again <laughs> and uh and I called her and, and I so you know this book changed my life and so we started having conversations and we talked a lot about um what art could be and, and she liked my big giant painting she was like you know you don't have to be doing you don't have to be picking up trash to do it you, you can do it any way you do it um not that we don't pick up trash because we do, right. but <laughs> but, um, but it, 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 how is the work operating holistically, and how can you do? You know, we can do anything now. So you know, like that's the great thing about we have an art center here where you know we have outreach to the prisons and we have outreach to the homeless and we uh, work and paint with the homeless folk, and it's it's a great thing for them and for us. Yeah. You know? So now we drive around the small town instead of just seeing some homeless person and try not to look at them. You know, you look at them and you say, Hey, Hey, Hey Mark, yeah, you yeah. know, and so you know everybody and it, and it's suddenly the world is more connected and, and that's what we, that's what we're called to do is to like 
know where we are in relationship to the other aspects of the thing right and how can we leave this world a little bit better than the way we found it and um, artists have the capability and the mindset and the right to, 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 to do that and operate in the world like that and it's sort of our our job to um, to do that regardless of what form our formal art is taking right so yeah that's that's one that I really think is a uh, it's a mind shift to be able to get into that place where it's no longer about you it's like about the whole thing definitely and, yeah I think it's so important and the energy of life energy of life is just flowing through you and you're letting it you know you're not blocking it by thinking me 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 right yeah, and I think a lot of artists do. They 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 do it in other avenues as well. You know what I mean? That may mm-hmm. not be directly related to their art, which is fine. You know, but I feel like scratching that itch in your life is important for sure. Um, all right. Last question: What is the most recent thing that you're really into as far as music? Like, what have you been listening to? What's what's uh, you know <laughs> tickling your fancy of late? Let's see, so many things because of the radio show. Um, well, I, uh, I let's see where where to start. Um, I've been liking. Well, there's so many things. Um, y- Yale name? Do you know Yale? I don't. She's a beautiful female singer songwriter, beautiful female voice. Uh, Yale is what Y A E L E L, and then name I think is N A I M. Maybe mm-hmm. I'm not too sure. Um, she's she's rather amazing. Um, I, I like Sunny War. I don't know if you know Sunny War. She's got a great voice. Uh, sort of important songs. Um, I'm marking these on Spotify I, as we speak. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thanks. Um, Look, look for Ju- Julie is her name. Do you know that one? I do know the name. I can't. Um, what does the music sound like? <laughs> it's this old timey stuff. Look at this. Oh, this, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got it here. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. Oh, Julie London. I mean, it's, it's Julie London. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, uh, and this radio show is, you know, I've seen some of the archive playlists. How did that come about? Um, this Harold Budd is really wonderful too. I don't know if That's you. It's a nice uh, cover. The, yeah, this is a beautiful cover. This is um, called Luxa L U X A. Nice. Harold uh, they, Budd. They, they, Harold Budd. Yeah. Vinyl. Yeah, sort of. Uh, yeah, I, I I like to play the record player. Yeah, vinyl's nice. My. I, um, I was a the radio show. Yeah, yeah. You were a DJ. Art house radio. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I choose all the songs and tell little stories, and it's it's sort of old fashioned, you know. I want it to be uh, like an analog kind of thing, yeah. and it's old fashioned radio. It's a college radio station here, eighty eight point five, nice W W C U G, and coming out of Columbus, Georgia. But it's online. Good, mo- like it streams, or you have archives of it. Both uh, the ar- some of the archives are about to come down because we've done over a hundred and four shows so far, but uh, we. Uh, or you can get it on Saturday and Sunday mornings um, on the TuneIn app or just ask the smart speaker to play 88.5 WCUG between 8 and 11 on the weekends. Um, but arthouseradio.com has some of the shows, yeah. uh, most of the shows archived. And But, you know, it's just um, good morning, sleepy town. <laughs> That's H-A-U-S for people who are going to look for it, Correct. Thank you. H A U S yes. Art House. H A U S Art House German Radio dot com. Um, but I tell little stories about you know, it's, as I said about the microcosm to the macrocosm. You tell little personal stories about your own life and experience, and then people have memories of their own uh, time when they learned to swim or learn to ride a bike, and it just it, it, it's to trigger a kind of nostalgia that uh, brings you more fully alive in the moment. Yeah. Because art is really the purpose of art is to wake us up, and and the, I like to say the purpose the purpose of Art House Radio is to wake us up gently. Nice. That's funny because I feel like my art puts people to sleep 
So I guess I'm in the wrong <laughs> game. <laughs> we, well, we we have a we have a late night show called Art House After Dark, oh, which go. that plays on the weekends that'll from resonate. ten to twelve, <laughs> and that'll put that'll put you to sleep. Yeah, it's all ambient. <laughs> oh, I remember that in college listening to like the ambient show on yeah, the yeah, local yeah. station. That was so great. You know, was, there was like a, so, a movement of ambient music. You know. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've gone back to that. My my son Man lives in New York, and and Man Bartlett, and he makes fantastic ambient work, and so we play some of his stuff and a lot of other. You know, oh, that's cool. Things, but I didn't know that. So he's a uh, musician. That's his. Yeah, he's a musician, and you know, he's he's a tech guy, and he works for um, Topic and nice. um, a lot of social media stuff. But he uh, he makes music and and art. Um, yeah, he's got an art practice. Nice and great and my other son is in california he's a he's a um, surfer sure that i mean that's he wor- <laughs> that all makes sense all of that he he worked for apple for many years and now he's you know retired catching waves catching waves that's what he does southern california but he's a great he's a great artist and musician too yeah bolinas nice wow yeah. that's gotta feel good so, uh, yeah and you got you got yeah. you know you got places to visit well exactly. when we're allowed to travel you know. Hey, that's coming up. Yeah, it yeah, is. We, we got we got our vaccinations. We were, you know, I'm of, of the age where I could get them. And so um, we're starting to have little small gatherings of older couples that have had vaccinations as well. So it's starting to feel a little more normal again down here yeah. in, in Georgia anyway. And today, starting today, actually, everyone can get vaccinated in Georgia. That's great. They just opened, just opened it up. Yeah, I got, when I got my, I've been clear now of my second for a couple of weeks or a few weeks and there was, you know, there's like a calm that happens after that, two weeks after that mm-hmm. second shot, I think. Well, you still know mm-hmm. you have to be safe and stuff, but it just feels good to to feel like, okay, we're doing something. Like, there's a proactive measure here. So hopefully, we're, you know, things can, you know, shape back. And uh, But, uh, you know, walking around, um, walking around Brooklyn and seeing more people out, and, you know, people wearing masks, but seeing people out and, like, meeting and... It just feels good, you know. Whereas in the beginning of last, like last year, and you saw people out, you'd be like, "What the hell are you doing?" Like, you know what I mean? That's irresponsible. But now you feel like, okay, we've got the roadmap here. Let's see, you know, some some responsible semblance of what was, you know. Oh, nice! We made little little pins. Nice. Yeah, we made these. It's a little V and a check in, in a green field, and so we made those, and so we're handing them out to everybody that gets vaccinated. Um, because I think there's a need to sort of prove that you, if you aren't wearing a mask, or even if you are, you know, to just show that you've been vaccinated right. uh, with a little pen. You're being responsible. Is a nice feature. You believe in science. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, and yeah, then what do you so, have? What do you have coming up with? The, so the 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 movie's out on all platforms, but um, what about with the artwork? What do you you know? What's your schedule? Um, the show at Miles McHenry in uh, May, mid mid May. In which space and are you going to be in? I think I'm in the or, original space. What's the address there? I don't know the 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 prime the, five twenty two. The original, right? yeah, yeah, the first one, yeah. I think it's five twenty two. Uh, yeah. I, I think so. I think so. Uh, but that's mid May, and I don't know the exact date. But uh, the work is, except for the last one that I'm still working on, yeah. Nice. Is all done, and most of the work is from the film. Actually, it's work related to the visual, uh, the visuals in the film. They're not stills, but they are concepts. Yeah, that conceptually are in the film. resonate with like ideas and moments in the film. That's great. Yeah, that'll be a yeah, nice. So, don't you love that when you work in different areas and they sort of resonate and triangulate? There's something cool about that, you know. That's the hope. Yeah, yeah, and and so it'll be. It, it, I'm I'm super excited about most all of the work and uh and the film being out at the same time is is nice and i will probably try to show it at, i imagine we'll probably try to show it at at the gallery yeah we have per- permission from the distributor to, to do that nice. miles and i haven't discussed it yet but i hope that we will be showing it have a showing and hopefully in may people will be vaccinated enough to actually come see the work right. and that'll be great yeah and I think it's going to be like a great um, time of it'll be like the roaring 20s people are going to be so ready to get oh, out yeah, it's going to be you know for all these people who are saying I'm a little it strikes a personal chord but you hear people not in New York talking about how crappy it is and it's desolate and no one's out and it's terrible I'm like it's not I mean I moved to New York in the late 90s and 
it's even today it's like they're they're complaining about garbage and stuff it's nothing like and that wasn't even like you know when i talked to friends of mine who were artists who've been around in like the 70s and stuff you know exactly when, so everything's fine people were just being responsible and locking themselves indoors for the most part yeah. and uh yes yeah, so there's a little more trash around but uh it'll get cleaned up and people are going to come out and like like to your point i think it's going to be a big old you know responsible yeah. party yeah, I think so too. I think everybody is going to um, need the release. You know, I'm, yeah. I can feel it just in, in the, the little shifts we've had down here already, and it, it's going to be a. Ho- hopefully, it'll it'll be a, a good time after quite a dark time. Yeah, in our history. Well, I mean, you weather storms, and they they teach you about yourself, and they test your, you know, test your metal, and you come out of it. You know, and hopefully stronger. Yeah. You know, we will all come out of it stronger. And with, you know, it's values clarification. We're deciding what's important to us. Yeah. And that's a, bl- a blessing to, to be able to have that time to do that. And, um, and you know, we have, but we have but one life, so we should live it and make this world a better place. Totally. And that's true. And, but just the caveat on the stronger thing, stronger mentally, because let's be honest, like, I need the gym. I miss the gym. Mm. <laughs> the home mm. gym doesn't work quite as well as the... <laughs> <laughs> well, we, yeah, we've we've taken to walking. So Betsy and I, my my wife, every day, usually in the afternoon, yeah, uh, sometimes in the morning, but usually, we, I mean, we walk, a, you know, a few miles every day. And um, we're down here where the weather is nice enough where you can do that year round. So, oh, um, that Georgia yeah, weather, we're, we're, yeah, it's lucky, it's lucky. It's, uh, but placement is everything. Yeah. Well, listen, it was great to talk. I thank you for the time. And, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the show, and everyone should check that out at Miles's. Thanks. And, um, yeah, and I'm going to check out the, uh, I'm going to check out that music. I got some book thing. I got a couple of films to watch. Books. I got I got some stuff yes. to do here. <laughs> I've got stuff to do, too. I, I want to hear your music. Do you have a way to hear that? Oh, boy. Uh, the, uh, right now I'm a, a bedroom producer I mean I'm just playing music with my son and you know doing stuff internally okay. I mean I was in a band we re- released a couple records and actually one of the, the guy who played trumpet trombone and pedal steel in that band was from Dahlonega Georgia and he now oh, owns really? a beer company a couple blocks away from me here in in Brooklyn so, really? a small world but yeah what, what, what? the uh, the band was called 33.3 Okay. And uh, right. it's on I'll, I'll look it up. Are you It's on Spotify, but there was apparently there's a death metal band from Germany called 333 and Spotify can't <laughs> delineate the period. Oh boy. So we get coupled in, but I think you'll be able to tell which one is the right band. <laughs> oh wow, they can't they can't do the period. I don't, yeah, I don't know what they they goofed on it, but anyways, we're 33.3. Is it a is it on Apple Music or any other way I could find it? I would imagine or it's you know? on Apple Music. You could find it on yeah. someone posted on YouTube. You know, you can, yeah. you can find it. All right, it. great. I look forward to hearing that. Thank and, you. you know, send me some clips if you have some stuff. I just love listening, you know, I love listening to new stuff and different stuff. And, and I, I'll i put it on the radio. Yeah, I will. And I'm working on, I can't really, I'm working on a project now, which is a suite of music videos of animations that I'm doing for a band mm-hmm. that I think you might dig. Um, so I'll send that to you off the record. Okay. Oh, that'd be wonderful. And, uh, Thanks. And that'll be coming out soon, so I can share that with everyone. But yeah, I want to. Uh, I'll share that um, that music with you. Okay, and I'll share some music back with you. So um, sounds you good. Know, all the things that I didn't mention that I, I want you to know about. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, man. All right. It was great. Yeah. Uh, you can listen to Man Bartlett if you if you want to hear. Oh some yeah, ambient, definitely. You know, beautiful ambient droning. Yeah, and he, he's he's. I think you can find that everywhere. Cool. I'll definitely check it out. All right. Thank you. Brian, thanks. Um, Yeah, enjoyed it. Thanks, me too. Many thanks to Bo Bartlett for taking the time out to talk. Many thanks also to Lullatone, who did this outro and the intro music. And many thanks, as always, to Michael Lovett for his introduction. You can check out his music at Nazca Lines, N-Z-C-A Lines, and you can also check him out in his other band, Metronomy. If you'd like to find out more information about the podcast, you could check it out on the website, sounddivisionpodcast.com, and you can find images and follow for photos and information on Instagram at Sound Podcast. 
You can also help out the podcast by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. It really helps out. And uh, thanks to New York Studio School for their sponsorship and Golden Artist Colors for their long withstanding sponsorship of this podcast. Uh, make sure you check out Bo's Films and his upcoming show at Miles McHenry Gallery. If you happen to be a listener in Tokyo, I am currently in a group show at Maho Kubota Gallery in Gaien Mai in near Harajuku in Aoyama, Japan, in Tokyo. So check out that show. And I will have some new work with her gallery at the Tokyo Art Fair, which opens very soon. So if you're over there in Tokyo, check it out. Otherwise, you can check out the work online. You can follow her at Maho Kubota Gallery on Instagram. And if you want to keep up to date on what I'm doing with my work, you can follow me on Instagram at Alfred Studio or BrianAlfred.net for the latest information on what I've got going on. Thanks again for listening and uh, got some more episodes coming up, which are going to be really great. So stay tuned. Thanks all.